Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video course where we talk about general vector spaces and general linear maps. And in today's part 26, we will extend our knowledge for matrix representations to compositions of linear maps. And there we will see that this is related to the matrix product as we already know it from matrices. But as always, before we start with the definitions, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And moreover, as a supporter, you get a bonus, which you can find with the link in the description. For example, there you find quizzes and PDF versions for the videos. Okay, and then I would say, let's start by recalling what we have learned in the last video about matrix representations of linear maps. There we had a nice picture in mind, namely we had an upper level with the abstract vector spaces V and W and the linear map L. And on the other hand, we also had a lower level for the concrete level of Rn or Cn. And for the translation to this lower level, it's necessary to choose bases B and C in our vector spaces. Because then we have a corresponding basis isomorphism for this translation. And the common name we have for this one is just capital Phi, where the index is the chosen basis B here. But here please keep in mind that some people don't give a name to the basis isomorphisms at all. They are just so natural that some mathematicians don't even bother to give them names. However, in this video series I want to make it always clear, so I will always write capital Phi to denote basis isomorphisms. Okay, and now we have already learned that on the lower level the linear map is represented by a matrix. And this matrix gets the two bases B and C in its name. It's called L with index basis B goes to basis C. And by definition we know that this is an M times N matrix. Very well, this is the picture and now we want to extend it because we want to talk about the composition of linear maps so we have to add a second one here. So let's say this is our linear map K from the vector space W to the vector space U. And moreover, let's say we choose a basis D there. So we have D1, D2 until we reach DK. So we have dimension N here, dimension M there and in the end dimension K. So you see we can do the same translations as before and we get a matrix representation for the linear map K as well. And the correct name would be K with index where C goes in and D comes out. So everything fits together here and this is a matrix of size K times M. Okay, and now as already expected, we want to talk about the composition of both linear maps. So this is K after L and definitely also a linear map. And now by going to the lower level here, we already see that we have a matrix representation for this one as well. It's simply given by combining the two matrices we've already got. This means we get the following formula for the matrix representation of K after L. And there we know that the basis B goes in and matrix D comes out. And indeed, we just have to calculate a matrix product. So first on the right we have the matrix with respect to L and then we simply multiply the other matrix from the left hand side. So this is the nice formula we get and you should definitely remember that and you can see everything fits together. The basis B comes in from the right hand side and the basis D goes out on the left hand side. And moreover here in the middle the basis C has to fit in. So basis C comes out here and goes in here again. This means if you are only interested in the matrix representation of K after L, it might be helpful to use this formula with a well chosen basis C in the middle. And how this exactly works, we can immediately discuss with an example. Hence we take two linear maps here and look at the composition. So let's start with L which should go from R3 into P2. So a vector with three components is sent to a polynomial. 
So we have numbers v1, v2 and v3 and we combine them with monomials. First for the monomial m0 I want to have the coefficient v1 plus v2 plus v3. And for the next one m1 I want to have v1 plus v2. So please recall m1 is just the monomial given by x. And finally the last one should be m2 which I want to multiply with v1. So what comes out here is a well-defined polynomial. As always you just have to know how the monomials here are defined. On the other hand I want to take a linear map k which now has the domain p2. And it should map into the real vector space r2. This means here we have to explain what we do with polynomials. And you already know what we can do with polynomials is for example calculating derivatives. So we could take the first derivative of p here and evaluate it at the point 1. What comes out is simply a number and this should be the first component of our vector in R2. And for the second component I want to have p of 1 minus the second derivative of p at the point 1 as well. So these are our definitions for L and K and let's put this into a picture again. We start with the vector space R3 and then we map into the polynomials. Hence there we just have our map L. And then in the next step we map into R2. So this is the linear map K and now we want to talk about the matrix representations. And let's say that we have the standard bases in R3 and in R2. And with respect to these I want to have the matrix representation of k after L. And if we want to calculate that by using the formula above we have the free choice for the basis C in the middle. And obviously a good choice there would be to choose the monomial basis. So the family given by M0, M1 and M2 simply because it immediately helps us with the map L. Hence in the first step here let's write down the matrix representation L starting with the basis B and going into the basis C. And there please recall the first column is simply given by the basis isomorphism of L of B1. And this continues and we know we have exactly three vectors in. We know by the dimensions of the vector space that we have to get out a 3 times 3 matrix here. And now we know that B1 is just the first canonical unit vector in R3, so simply 1, 0, 0. And there we get out for L 1 times M0 plus 1 times M1 plus 1 times M2. So each basis element occurs once, so we have the column 1, 1, 1. And for the second we simply put in 0, 1, 0. So what we get out here is first 1 times M0 and 1 times M1 but 0 times M2. And finally the last column gives us 1, 0, 0. And there we have it. This is the whole matrix representation of L and it was not hard to calculate at all. Simply because we already chose the best basis C depending on the given definition of L. However now we have to use the same basis for our linear map K and there we have to see how it works out. So now what we have to put in are the three monomials M0, M1 and M2. So we also have three columns here but we land in R2 which means we only have two rows now. So let's put M0 into K and then we see we have to calculate the first derivative of the constant m0. And of course there we know the constant will give us the derivative of 0. But in the second entry here we find p of 1 which is always 1 for our constant 1. Hence we get 0, 1 in the first column here. And now you can do the same for the monomial 1 and we get 1, 1 for the second column. So you see we simply have to calculate derivatives of our function x. And in the next step we have to calculate the derivatives of the function x squared which means we get 2 in the first component here and minus 1 in the second. So at the end of the day we see calculating the matrix representation of k 
was also not hard at all. Indeed, calculating derivatives for monomials is really simple. And now for the last step, we just have to use the formula from above, which means we have to calculate one matrix product here. So we simply put columns and rows together, and then we get 3, 1 here, and 1, 2 in the second column, and finally 0, 1 here in the last column. And there we have it. This is the matrix representation of k after l. And in fact, it's with respect to the standard basis in R3 and with respect to the standard basis in R2. So you see, this formula here is really helpful because it allows us to do all the calculations on the lower level, on the matrix level. And indeed, this also gives us a very general result for invertible linear maps. This means if L is invertible, we can look at the matrix representation of this one as well. In the general picture, we have that L goes from V to W and L inverse goes from W to V. And please don't forget, we already know that this implies that L inverse is also linear. And now the matrix representation here is with respect to the basis C going into the basis B. So this is a matrix and it can be calculated by using the matrix representation of L. The only thing we have to do is to invert this matrix as well. In fact, you should see this one is just a special case of the general formula for the composition. And this implies now that an invertible linear map always has a matrix representation which is invertible as well. To say it in other words, this is a square matrix with determinant not equal to zero. So we immediately see that this only works if the dimensions from the left hand side and the right hand side don't change, so we have n is equal to m in this case. Only then we have square matrices and we can have invertible linear maps. So please remember this general effect. If the dimension of v is unequal to the dimension of w, then a linear map is never invertible. Other maps could be invertible, but linear maps cannot be. So there we have it. Now you know how to calculate matrix representations for compositions and invertible maps. And I would say, let's discuss some more aspects of this with the next videos. So I really hope we meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye.